Okay, um, hello. Um, still some people filtering in here, but I'm just gonna get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to MTRI's Summer Seminar Series. My name is Allison Fortune. I'm the Student Researcher Assistant here at Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. Just gonna double check. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting here today in Gespuik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. Um, the MTRI is a research-based nonprofit nestled in the Southwest Nova Scotia near Kedji National Park and Historic Site. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Gaspoic and beyond. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Nick Knudsen and Noah Hardy. Um, next, I will hand the seminar over to um, the presenters, but I would like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the chat or wait until the question period. <laughs> Sorry, Allison, I, uh, I just joined. Was that the uh, prompt to, to get going? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you. My name is uh, Nick Knudsen, and we're going to be hearing from uh, Noah Hardy as well a little bit later. We're going to be talking today about the new uh, Nova Scotia Herp Atlas. It's a uh, project that's being uh, managed in large part by us at uh, Mercy Tobiatic Reachers. Research Institute and uh, a project that was funded in large part by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, so quick overview, it's not, uh, it's not super common to have two people presenting. So uh, kind of uh, just a quick overview of what we're each gonna be talking about. So I'm just gonna kind of give an example of what are HERPs and what is a HERP Atlas and talk a little bit about the previous Atlas um, and then talk a little bit about our new project. And then Noah's going to come in and uh, share some of the special observations that we've had so far. And um, uh, you know, the passion that he has for these species. And so uh, I would say, uh, you know, ask any questions that you have at any time. But if you have questions about the project itself, um, certainly uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to try to answer those. And I saw that we have a few organizers as well on the, on the call. Um, but if you have questions about the species themselves, um, I think you can uh, you could hold on to them until Noah's presenting and uh, and ask him. Um, so herps, uh, <laughs> what are herps? So it's kind of a it's a term that's given to uh, reptiles and amphibians, uh, the study of reptiles and amphibians, uh, herp herpetology, herptofauna. Um, really, it's the study of non-avian reptiles and amphibians, because if we see here the, the uh, cladistic tree from um, University College London, uh, we don't actually see birds included in herps. Really, we're talking about kind of the, I guess you can say the ectothermic tetrapods. So within tetrapods, the ones that uh, are not creating their own heat. Um, so in Nova Scotia, uh, what this means, and just highlighting a few of the pictures that we've collected so far, um, this means we're talking about our snakes, uh, like the common garter snake, an image here from uh, M.K. Kennedy. Uh, we're talking about our turtles, uh, like the eastern painted turtle, an image here from El Peru. Uh, frogs, like the nor northern leopard frog, an image here from Rene on our naturalist. And salamanders, like the uh, eastern redback salamander. And a picture here from David in Cape Breton. Um, so the herp atlas, we're examining herps. Um, an atlas examines uh, the herps in a certain area. And so for us, it's uh, Nova Scotia, obviously. Um, 
And then within, uh, within that, as we study the herps in Nova Scotia, we have multiple objectives. Um, so it'd be fun to, uh, you know, we hope to learn about the distribution of the herps in Nova Scotia, the timing of them, uh, important places, and sometimes important places um, can even be something kind of morbid, like uh, places where there's a lot of road mortality, for example. Um, it's still really important to know about those places if we're studying the herps, even though, um, you know, insofar as important places go, it's kind of a, a sad one. Um, another great thing, you know, studying the abundance of our species. So um, how many are there? Which ones are, are maybe less common? Um, and then I think all atlases, uh, ours including the previous one and, and atlases that are done for other species, there's often this kind of quite large public engagement um, angle where we're also trying to kind of get the public engaged with the species we're studying and have them involved in the study of them as well. So the uh, previous atlas um, ran for five years. I think uh, I, I wasn't actually involved, but if I understand correctly, I think the first year 98 was kind of a, a trial uh, data collection year. So four or five years. And they had 189 volunteer atlasers who submitted uh, almost 6,200 records over the five years. Um, and uh, it's interesting, some of the wording kind of looking back now and comparing with this project, uh, we'll talk about it later, but um, we see here uh, the participants also took lots of photographs. Um, so kind of mentioning photographs as a special thing. And, um, you know, that's kind of maybe distinct compared to the project that we have this year. But we'll talk about that. Um, so atlases are, are a collaborative project. So uh, the one that we're running this year is very collaborative. Uh, the previous one was also very collaborative. And you see a lot of the same partners um, involved in the same project or in this project. Um, and so again, just talking about the previous atlas. So uh, we had these uh, almost 200 volunteers who collected these observations. But uh, it's important to note that there was kind of a very systematic way that they went about this. and so. There were general observations, but there's also targeted squares. And so we were really trying to get this idea of kind of coverage across the province. Um, and so that's an important thing. You don't want to just be collecting uh, observations from places where there's a lot of people, for example. You want to send people into those hard to get places as well. Uh, so the new, Her new Herp Atlas, our, our new project, continues to be collaborative. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going about it, I guess, but there's a lot of promotion involved. And so that involves uh, kind of countless partners. Um, I see quite a few of them on the call here. So if you've shared one of our posts or um, promoted uh, one of our events or promoted our project to your members, um, thank you very much. And um, then we have a kind of planning committee uh, made up of a few uh, core partners. So Environment and Climate Change Canada is still there, uh, Lands and Forestry, uh, the province. Friends of Keji, Parks Canada, Coastal Action, uh, Clean Annapolis River Project in Annapolis Royal, Cadia University, the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center, so often ACCDC, um, organization who kind of collects the data that we're, that we're collecting here, and, uh, and of course us, the Mercedobiotic Research Institute. Um, so for us, uh, of course, it's the Nova Scotia Herb Palace. We are still uh, very interested um, area-wise in all of Nova Scotia. But in particular, we're interested, uh, or, you know, I guess the project uh, got its origin or was based in Guestwick or, or Southwest Nova Scotia here. And uh, one of the reasons for that is, uh, is that a few years ago, there was a change to um, our species at risk conservation approach in Canada. And we started to take this, um, this pan-Canadian approach where certain priority places were identified in the country. And uh, Guestwick or Southwest Nova Scotia is actually one of the, uh, one of those identified places. Um, and so through some of that funding, um, you know, recognizing the cool biodiversity and the great biodiversity that we have here in Southwest Nova, and we got some funding from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada to run this Herp Atlas. Um, and so objectives, you know, really similar to the ones we already mentioned. So uh, learning about the distribution, the timing, abundance of our herps, um, you know, trying to attract some of the rare species, getting that public engagement, and a lot of the same things as, as the previous atlas. Um, but one of the things that's maybe different is uh, is just the way that technology has evolved since that last atlas, and and especially in the in the field of uh, of ecology, it's really kind of hot right now. 
Um, we have all kinds of different technologies that are coming out to help people identify nature and to record data. Um, one of the really most popular ones, uh, iNaturalist, it's one of the ones that we decided to go with for, for our Herp Atlas project. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a platform that already has almost uh, or over five and a half million observations of nature just in Canada. Um, so we're not talking about kind of a fringe um, program. It's a, it's a really popular one. And so when we say that we're using that, I guess really what we're doing is really promoting uh, the use of it. And really we've been encouraging uh, Nova Scotians to use it um, with the help of a lot of our partners and, and a lot of promotion. And uh, I think I'll, I'll have some results for you in a second here, but I think we can, we can say that we are having an impact and that we are um, seeing an increase in, in herb observations. Um, so iNaturalist, uh, you know, this is, I've given presentations on iNaturalist before, and that's not what this will be, but just to give you kind of a quick rundown that when you take a picture online on iNaturalist, uh, right away, there's an algorithm in the uh, software that'll suggest to you a species of what you saw. And so you'll upload your species, it'll drop a pin on a map, so you get a location, it'll tell you uh, when you saw the species. And then, as you can see down here, you'll also get uh, other iNaturalist users who can come along after you and help you confirm what species you saw. So it's a really great uh, platform for collecting observations of nature. And, uh, and some of the benefits, so we mentioned before, you know, the fact that it was worth mentioning uh, getting some pictures on the last, or not some pictures, but, um, you know, the, the fact that pictures maybe weren't with the majority of the observations last time, maybe. Um, and the importance of pictures. So I guess uh, for me, you know, northern leopard frog, for example, and mink frog, uh, without pictures, um, unless you were really uh, quite experienced in identifying these species, it would be really hard, especially if you consider that these are pictures that we've kind of frozen in time and zoomed in on in our computer. Um, so if you're talking about a picture or a quick sight of one of these species in nature, it'd be really difficult if you didn't have a picture and if you didn't have experts who could help. Um, another benefit, you know, we see the pin here uh, automatically. You don't have to try to remember, oh, where is it exactly that I saw that species? Some of these new technologies, they do that for you. And um, so it really reduces the effort required by the observer. And then on the right here, we have an example of kind of the type of discussion that can happen underneath a certain picture. Um, you know, so uh, for example, is a certain species a green frog? And then uh, someone will actually suggest no it's a mink frog and then they'll give some uh, justification and um, someone will agree with that mink frog but then we have a maverick here who's saying no i still think it's a green frog so you get this really cool debate going um and i think it's a uh, you can count that as a bit of a naturalist because it makes it more engaging to uh, to observe nature um, but then also some drawbacks of iNaturalist um, and, and technology. So contact and effort. So contact, uh, that's really what I'm trying to say there is just, it's not always so easy to contact the participants when you're kind of launching a public project like this. Um, whereas last time, uh, you know, every person sending in observations was maybe easier to track down because maybe you knew who they were. They sent it in um, by a, a method that was easier to track. For us with iNaturalist, um, you know, we have this uh, observation here, for example, a blending's turtle uh, right near Halifax. So uh, it would be very surprising to see this. We, we're not sure this is a real observation. Uh, we think someone's maybe trying to pull our leg or something. And so we can reach out and I, I've sent messages to this uh, user here, Kaylee Coco. And if anyone knows who they are, um, if you could uh, help us get in touch with them, that would be great. But outside of trying to reach out to them through iNaturalist, it's kind of hard for us to actually get a hold of them and ask for more details about this observation. Whereas before, that might have uh, that might have been easier. Um, and the other uh, the other point, so effort. So we can imagine this same um, this same uh, observation. So we don't know how long it might have taken Kaylee Coco to see this planning turtle, um, even if she did. Uh, did it take her? five minutes and so every five minutes you kind of see a blanding turtle in this area or was she out there for uh, two weeks straight of continuously combing through uh, little pieces of habitat and finally she saw one so knowing about that effort tells us a lot about how many of those species there are so that's another thing that's a little bit lacking with the iNaturalist but um, we are hoping to get uh, through that problem next year 
Um, so the new Herp Atlas, we have kind of two, uh, two years, uh, two strategies, 2021 and 2022. So this year, we're really just focused on uh, using a naturalist to collect observations, promoting it as a tool, uh, trying to reach out to some of our more keen observers to uh, sign them up for our, our next year. And next year, uh, to get around some of those questions around effort and, uh, and contact that we had mentioned before, um, we're actually going to be doing uh, some specific area uh, surveys similar to the previous Herp Atlas. Um, and we're going to be doing that with the help of some trained surveyors that will be um, kind of training separately and giving some extra training to. And they'll be collecting effort. So we will finally be getting that, uh, that missing piece. Um, so timing of the Herp Atlas, um, you know, like a lot of biodiversity, uh, herps in Nova Scotia and, and in the rest of the world are having a hard time. Um, you know, it doesn't take much looking on online to find some kind of scary uh, headlines about it. Um, just very quickly, uh, I found a study from uh, World Wildlife Federation that, um, in, that amphibians and reptiles, the, the herps, um, compared to other at-risk species are actually facing even more threats. And that was related to the fact that they were using both uh, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So both of those ecosystems are having a hard time. And since amphibians and reptiles required both, they were seeing even more um, issues. Um, they're among the most threatened species on Earth. Uh, globally, more than 20 are threatened with extinction. That's from the uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature. And over and 60% of the world's turtles are threatened with uh, or are extinct. And uh, we'll see that kind of point come up again um, right here. So kind of looking at us, so we have uh, provincially the Endangered Species Act, um, and we have four provincially listed uh, reptiles, uh, the Blanding's turtle that's endangered, the wood turtle and the Eastern ribbon snake that are threatened, and the snapping turtle that are vulnerable, but Already, uh, you know, you can see here three of the four species we're talking about are uh, turtles. And uh, at a federal level, so uh, the Species at Risk Act, uh, Nova Scotia has six federally listed reptiles. And uh, of these, we focus mostly on the on the freshwater freshwater species. So uh, as excited as we are uh, to see leatherback turtles, and uh, we thought it was really great that we uh, we had that sighting of one down in uh, in Owl's Head recently, and hopefully that will make its way onto our uh, Herp Atlas project. It'd be nice to see. Um, but mostly we're, we're focused on the Blandings turtle, snapping turtle, eastern, eastern painted wood turtle, and uh, eastern ribbon snake. And so again, here we're talking about four out of the five are uh, turtles. And so a lot of these herps share many common threats. Um, so vehicles, for example, we can see here, uh, both uh, Blanding's turtle, wood turtle, snapping turtle, and ribbon snake. Uh, accidental mortality from roads has been identified as a, as a high or medium threat for all four of those. And that gets back to what I was saying is, um, you know, data collection that sometimes can seem morbid, but that actually is like really crucial and important is stuff like uh, where is there, uh, where are the hotspots for road mortality? If we can identify them, maybe we can, uh, you know, bring, in, bring about some changes to reduce that. Um, okay, so talking a little bit about our uh, results now. So, you know, results, what have we been doing? Well, we've been promoting iNaturalist as a tool, like I was saying, and, and I think um, the, the proof is in uh, how well we've been doing. So uh, already this year, we have, uh, this is from yesterday, so we have uh, even more now, but uh, more than 2,200 observations of herps um, in Nova Scotia. We've had um, 538 people upload a herp picture to iNaturalist. And, and so 538 people help us with our project and by collecting an observation and then 254 people who have helped us by identifying those pictures once they've been uploaded. So that kind of backend work, which, which is really tricky. You know, we've seen those, we saw those two pictures of the, of the similar frogs. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of work to distinguish some of these and, uh, and you can see on the project uh, how much work is going into it. It's really, thank you very much for everyone. Um, so comparing a little bit to uh, to last year, so um, or to the last atlas, um, so we had uh, 6,200 observations over five years by 189 volunteers. So uh, we can see already uh, 538 uh, people collecting observations as opposed to a uh, little under 200. So 
uh, really kind of taking advantage of iNaturalist and the fact the fact that we reach so many people by by tying into some technology like that. And um, you know, hopefully the the observations were on pace to to collect more, and hopefully that'll that'll continue. And um, of course, there is a general increase in iNaturalist use as well, um, which is about 30% I saw. So the increase in herp observations on iNaturalist for Nova Scotia year over year is about 180. So if we took off that 30% general increase, um, we're having an impact roughly of about 150% increase in the uh, herp observations on iNaturalist. So I, I think we are having a, a significant impact. Um, and of course, uh, these types of observations, these projects, uh, public data collection, it's always easier to sell these projects if we're collecting uh, observations of those rare species, of those species of, uh, of concern. And uh, so far in our project, we have 409 turtle observations and 10 uh, ribbon snake observations. And I included uh, one of the ribbon snake observations here, just thought it was a really, it's not the, it's a, a picture, a very good picture. It's hard to get a picture of a snake. I was very impressed. Um, and another nice thing about the results so far is that we're starting to see really good coverage across Nova Scotia. Um, we were starting off uh, really mainly just seeing uh, a lot of participation in HRM, obviously, and then quite a bit near Keji. But now we're really starting to see it uh, take off across the province. So that's really wonderful. And thank you again, everyone who's, uh, who's been promoting iNaturalist. Um, and then, so next year, uh, again, to bring it up, we're going to be working with trained surveyors and volunteers to record and target uh, priority areas. And so if you are interested in, in doing some of this and participating in that section and doing some of that training, um, you can email us. We have a, an email set up for the project, herpsns at gmail.com. And uh, if you just want to send us your name and your county, just so we know roughly uh, where you might be interested or most interested in doing those surveys and we'll, uh, we'll get right back to you. Um, so how to get involved in general. So you can observe HERP, so use iNaturalist. Um, if, you're, if you're against using iNaturalist, if you don't have a, a smartphone that can do it, and you can also uh, just observe HERPs the old fashioned way and, and record those observations and send them to us still using that same uh, Gmail account. And if you have any questions about getting onto iNaturalist or, or getting an account and how to, how to make that happen, uh, we can help with that as well. And um, for people who are already helping us, if you could fill out our survey, um, and I'll, I'll put the link to the uh, survey in the chat here for the presentation, but that's going to help us uh, get an idea for how much effort people have put in so far. Um, so that'll start to somewhat give us an idea for some of those abundance questions. It'll also um, help us just get a feeling for how much work people are putting into this project. All right, so uh, so with that, hopefully uh, we have a good idea of kind of what the project is, um, where we're going, uh, how we're kind of uh, taking advantage of, of a lot of the good ideas that came out of the last Atlas um, and how technology is, is helping us, but we're also having a few issues with it. And so now I think uh, we can turn it over to uh, Noah who can share uh, some of the, First of all, he's gonna, I think, go through the uh, the different groups of species that we're talking about and really kind of, you know, highlight some of the great pictures we have and, and talk about that. Um, and then we also have kind of some, some standout observations that are exceptionally rare. And I think uh, he'll also talk about some of those, but um, I think if you have any questions about the uh, presentation, um, I can maybe uh, take a minute now and just give you a chance and, and Noah can get ready for his part. Um, All right, well, we'll keep going. Noah, are you, uh, are you good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go, man. All right, take it away. All right, so first off, hello, everyone. I'm uh, pretty excited to be able to share all these observations with you today. It's something I'm very enthused about is this project. And uh, we'll just jump right into it. And uh, first, I'll be covering the frogs. So here is the eight frog species we have in the province. And uh, on the next slide, we'll uh, start to break it down. So we have three different types of frogs. This is our first type. Uh, it's a toad and our toad species is the Eastern American toad. And so what that means is why is a toad special? Why is it different? Uh, 
And the thing that makes it different from the other frog species is that it has the lack of webbing between its toes. And uh, like a true frog has the full webbing between its toes. And I'll get to what the tree frog has here in a second. But uh, another great identification factor for the American toad is that, as you can see, it kind of has this bumpy skin that a lot of people think represents uh, warts. And what that is, it's actually storage glands for it's the sticky white um, mucus, kind of. And uh, when a predator is to bite the toad, it gets that in the mouth and it's just a terrible day for it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> So next we'll move on to our tree frogs and our type of tree frog uh, in Nova Scotia is the spring peeper. And you can note uh, that make, like what makes it special is the toes and what's on the toes is these adhesive discs and these discs help it to stick to any object that would really like it's, it's quite miraculous. And um, so some great identification tips for this frog is um, the marbleization on the back, uh, it usually forms an X pattern as well as it has a V pattern on the face. And a really cool fact about these frogs is that uh, adults average between two to 3.3 centimeters, but they can produce a call that is heard over one to two and a half miles, which is like astonishing for such a small species. <laughs> and uh, we'll move on to our true frogs next. And so uh, what it means to be a true frog is, uh, I think it's what most people think of as like a typical frog. It's a fully webbed back foot. And so that means that these are mostly aquatic frogs and they don't spend too much time out of the land mostly. So uh, I'll go into some identification factors for this guy. So we'll start with the mink frog and that's the one on the top left hand corner. And so uh, ways to identify a mink frog is um, as you can see on the photo beneath it, the green frog, they can get pretty confusing sometimes, but the green frog will have barring on its legs and the mink frog has spots on its legs. So they're broken. They're not full bars. And uh, some more things is uh, that it has front feet that are webbed where uh, the green frog does not. And uh, that's as well as the bullfrog and most of the other frogs. It's a great identification tip. If you see a webbed front foot, it most likely might be a mink frog. Uh, so the webbing on the toes also, if you're looking at the back feet and you can't see the front feet, uh, this frog has the largest webbing out of all the frogs. So the webbing goes to the very last point of the toe and uh, Another identification tip that my friend Allison tells me is that they smell like a mink or like onions. And I'm not too experienced with that one yet, but I'll test it out. <laughs> and uh, we'll move on to the green frog now, which is on the bottom left-hand corner. And uh, the main thing to identify this frog is that it lacks the webbing of the front feet, like the mink frog. And uh, it has this dorsal fold so the ridge you see going behind the eyes and the tampum, and the tampum is the frog's eardrum. And uh, that is, it's most prominent on green frogs. So if you see a very prominent dorsal ridge, it's probably a green frog. And uh, now we'll cover the American bullfrog. So that's the guy to the right of the green frog. And how you identify them is, Number one, these are some big boys. They're, they're very large animals. They can be they're the largest frog in uh, Canada. And uh, another great identifying fact is uh, behind the eyes and above the tampum, as I was saying before with the green frog and the dorsal ridge, they have a fold of skin above their tampum, which all the other frogs are lacking. So if you see the large fold of skin, behind the tampon, behind the eyes, it's most likely an uh, American bullfrog. And now we'll, uh, yeah, right there, right there, Nick. <laughs> uh, so now we'll move on to the Northern leopard frog and the pickerel frog. And I'll kind of do these two at the same time because they can get kind of confusing, or sorry, I'll, I forgot about the wood frog. Uh, so this guy here, he can get a little mixed up with the spring peeper just because of the coloration. But the main identifying factor is this frog to a spring peeper would be that flashy black mask that uh, all the other species are lacking. 
And uh, the Black Mask uh, actually earned the name, uh, the nickname for the frog, the robber frog, which I thought was pretty interesting. And uh, now we'll move on to uh, the northern leopard frog and pickerel frog. So uh, the main factors to differ these two are that the northern leopard frog usually has a much brighter body color. It's usually uh, lime, uh, lemon green, uh, but it can sometimes be light brown. So the big identification factor for this guy would be that the the spots are not in order as on the pickerel frog. They aren't uniform and they'll be kind of sporadic. And as well as there is lime green bordering of the spots of the uh, northern leopard frog. And also the northern leopard frog lacks the barring of the pickerel frog. It has spots on its legs instead of the bars. And uh, so I'll just cover some things on the pickerel frog and that is that they are mostly uniform brown. You won't see too many green pickle frogs. Uh, usually if you see a green pickle frog, it's probably a leopard frog. And uh, so their spotteds are, uh, they're rectangular in shape and they're usually uniform. They're going in two rows. And as I said before, there is barring on the legs. So now we'll uh, jump into some cool observations of frogs we got so far. And uh, this is one that I've uh, gotten myself. And I got to say, I, I couldn't even believe this thing was real when I seen it. Like I, I had to take my sunglasses off a couple of times just to comprehend what I was seeing. So uh, this is a blue morph American bullfrog. And uh, it was, yeah. <laughs> the reason that it is blue is because it has a skin mutation and it's unable to produce the pigment in its skin that makes the yellow on it. So it can't actually turn green. So it turned it into this beautiful blue color. But a cool thing about this frog is that actually on the throat, as you can see, it has a very enhanced yellow and a nice uniform pattern and very nice. <laughs> so now we'll jump on to the next one. And uh, these observations were very exciting to see on the Herp Atlas. So we're up to three blue morph frogs so far this year. And uh, these are two green frogs, as you can see by the dorsal ridge above the tampum and behind the eye. All right, and I'll move on to the next one. And so these are our four turtle species in the province, our, our four native turtle species. And uh, I'll jump right into the identifications. We'll start with the top left-hand side, and that's the Eastern Painted Turtle. So this is personally one of my favorite turtles. Um, how you identify them is it's one of the smallest turtle species in the province, as well as that it is the most colorful. So the particularly the front legs of the turtle has very bright red markings, which will distinguish it from uh, the other turtle species found. And as well as it has uh, red on the lower of the neck that raises into yellow on the head. Um, the smooth black carapace. So first I'll go over what a carapace is. So the top of a turtle shell is the carapace and the bottom part of a turtle shell is the plasteron. So on this turtle, the Eastern Pana turtle, as you can see, the top of the turtle shell, the carapace is black and it is intersected by these greenish yellow margins. And so the yellow uh, plasteron on the bottom is sometimes can be fully yellow, but sometimes they can have dark plastral blotching. But this varies between individual turtles. You won't see too much uh, uniform turtles. Usually they, they look pretty, pretty separate. Uh, now we'll move on to the uh, common snapping turtle. And how you identify these guys is he's on the top right hand side. Uh, it is our largest freshwater turtle species in Nova Scotia. And because of its size, uh, the large head and the muscular structure, this is actually the only turtle species in Nova Scotia that can't retract itself fully into its shell, which helps to give him that sassy little attitude. And uh, another thing that uh, is easily identifiable with them is that their head is much larger than any other turtle species. 
and as well as their tail is. And on their tail, there are these very prominent uh, ridges, scales that go up the tail. And uh, you'll definitely recognize it. Um, another thing about this turtle shell is on the back of the carapace, it has almost sawing. So it's serrated on the back of the turtle shell where the rest of the back of the turtle shells are smooth. Uh, now we'll move on to the wood turtle. And uh, so wood turtles are found mostly in Eastern and Central Nova Scotia and on Cape Breton Island. And they are the most terrestrial turtle in Nova Scotia. And uh, the carapace, so as you can see, uh, each individual scoop, they have a wood grain look to them, which helps them uh, adapt into their habitat and get away from predators that they won't be seen. And so unlike other turtle species in Nova Scotia, as they are so terrestrial, they spend a lot of their time foraging on the land. And a cool adaptation that they have got because of that is that they have learned how to rain stomp which is they will stomp their feet and this mimics the rain and it causes the worms to come up from the surface and uh, they basically just get a little buffet for themselves. <laughs> and now we'll, uh, we'll cover the guy in uh, the bottom right and that is the Blanning's turtle. And, uh, the Blanding's turtle can only be found in southwest Nova Scotia and the chin is bright yellow and the smooth black shell is uh highly domed and it, it's been said that it represents an army helmet i've heard before and it also has uh prominent yellow to uh striped yellow markings on it nice and so uh when you think of turtle threats, these are what normally come to mind, and that's mortality from vehicles, unnaturally high predation rates, and uh, that would be from things such as raccoons and all that predating the nests, as well as mortality of uh, full-grown adults does happen, uh, habitat loss and degradation, uh, altern uh, altering uh, water levels, so damming habitats where turtles are present the illegal removal of turtles such as for pets or for food sources and climate change threatened turtle species. So this is another possible threat to the, uh, our native turtle species though, as it's not as prominent right now. Uh, this is the introduction of invasive species such as the ones depicted here, pond sliders. And these are introduced by people releasing them as pets. And uh, so far, all of the recorded observations of the uh, pond sliders have been in the HRM. And how you identify a pond slider compared to the other Nova Scotia turtle species is that it is a large turtle. It is much larger than a Eastern painted turtle. Uh, it lacks the red marking of the Eastern painted turtle on the legs. And it usually has a prominent patch of yellow to red on the sides of the head. And as well, most of our turtle species have a flatter jaw, while this guy has a much rounded circular jaw. I'll move on to salamanders. And in Nova Scotia, there are five different species of salamanders and we're gonna break them up into different types. So on the next slide, we'll look at the mole salamanders. And so the two species of mole salamander we have is I'll start with the one on the left, and that is the blue spotted salamander. This is a very easy identifiable species by the varying number of pale blue markings along the sides of the, the ridges. And then the other mole salamander species we have in the province is the spotted salamander. And so that is the largest of the spot, uh, salamander species found in Nova Scotia. And uh, it's very distinguishable by the bright yellow spots on the salamander. And now our next slide, we have some awesome uh, 
mole salamander action. So uh, on the top left-hand corner, we have uh, the start of a mole salamander's life, and that is an egg mass. And that would be laid in uh, mid-spring. And then once those eggs develop, we have the first stage of a, a larval. So it has the gill buds. And uh, that is when the egg is hatching. That's the first stage of the mole salamander's life. And then it moves into the larva with four limbs and hind limbs. So it has more of the ability to move and go about its business. And as you can see, it has fully developed outer gills. And uh, eventually, as the stages go on, as you can see in the picture above it, the spotted salamander, the reason that the mole salamander is special because uh, compared to the other salamander types in Nova Scotia is that they have fully developed lungs at this stage. And so they can breathe air with their lungs. <laughs> and uh, on the next one, the, the two photos to the right, we have uh, possible outcomes that can happen to our mole salamanders in the province. And so we have uh, natural predation in the top picture. And uh, wow, what a what a great observation, MK Kennedy. That's that's really cool. Um, it's a garter snake eating a yellow spotted salamander, which is a pretty rare coincidence to get to see natural predation of a yellow spotted salamander. And uh, on the bottom right hand corner, we have road mortality, which uh, was observed by me on uh, the day that uh, it's the big salamander migration. So. Most some of our uh, amphibian species, such as yellow spotted salamanders, blue spotted salamanders, spring peepers, wood frogs, and the occasional American toad, will come out on the first warm, rainy spring night with temperatures around seven degrees and go to vernal pools to start their breeding. And that's uh, when the cycle starts over again, laying these egg masses. So our next type of salamander is the lungless salamander. So what's lungless salamander? Uh, that is a salamander that breathes through its skin. It does not have developed lungs such as the mole salamander. And uh, the two types of lungless salamanders we have here in the province is the red back, eastern redback salamander and the four-toed salamander. So how you distinguish these is the redback salamander is usually you see them in two main color phases, and that is the redback, which you can see in these two photos. And then there also is a lead black phase, which is mostly like it's lacking the uh, red stripe. So it's a mostly black salamander. And then a rare occurrence is the all red phase, which is a completely red eastern uh, redback salamander. And uh, a lot of this coloration. Uh, it depends on, uh, uh, it changes across the populations around Nova Scotia. So there is more percentages uh, coastal to inland of some of these morphologies. And uh, so in the bottom, we'll look at our four-toed salamander. And this is actually the only observation of a four-toed salamander so far on the atlas. So if anyone's to find one, it's a very exciting thing. And uh, how you identify a four-toed salamander is, they are an orange to brown color on top, and uh, they have black, uh, patches of black spotting on the side that moves down into a white underbelly. And uh, something that makes them look a little separate from the redback is that they are a much more slender species. Uh, their tail doesn't really get as thick as the redback. And now we'll move on to our last type of salamander. And so our last type of salamander is the newt and what makes the newt unique is that it is made for an a mostly aquatic life at its adult stage so uh whereas the mole salamander and the lungless salamander have feet for digging in the soil the eastern newt has webbed back feet as well as a paddled tail and as you can see these two photos don't exactly look similar so what's going on here is that the red spotted salamander as it's earlier in its life, it starts out as the picture on the left, which is the red elf stage. So that is the terrestrial juvenile stage of the uh, red spotted newt. And then uh, the top right photo, that is the adult stage, the aquatic stage of the red spotted newt.
All right, now we'll move on to our snakes. So we have five snake species in the province and all these species that live here, they are non-venomous and they do pose no threat to humans. And uh, snakes play a vital role in our ecosystem here in Nova Scotia, and they can be very beneficial around your home for insect control with species such as slugs and caterpillars and other things. And uh, so we'll move on to the identification now. We'll start with the one on the uh, top left-hand side, and that is the Eastern Ribbon Snake. And so how you identify them is usually uh, they will have a velvety black uh, backside and on the head, body, and tail. And uh, on the sides, you'll see more of a brown pattern. And a big identification factor for them is the yellow striping down the middle and on each side of the back, or uh, on <laughs> each of the sides, sorry. And uh, there is also a white crescent in front of the eye. So now we'll move on to the maritime garter snake. And the main color of this snake is commonly brown to red or green, but there is large variations of uh, this snake in the province. And that's actually even documented reports of melanistic garter snakes in Nova Scotia, though they are more uh, on islands in Nova Scotia. And what that means, what's a melanistic garter snake? They are a fully slate black garter snake with even a black tongue, which is a pretty unique thing to see. Uh, there's no observations of that yet. And uh, so another thing that you can identify the garter snake with is uh, usually they will have three stripes, one down along the back and two or one along each side of its body. And uh, a way to help differ them from the Eastern ribbon snake is that they have uh, white and brown and black checkering back uh, throughout the snake. And uh, that will not be on uh, Eastern ribbon snake. So now we'll do the red belly snake. And uh, they can come in a large diversity of colors, though usually they are shades of brown, gray, and black. And this one here, he's a, a grayish looking snake. And um, each color phase, uh, they, they all have one thing in common. And as you can see on the back of the neck, that is that they have three spots. <laughs> And uh, another thing that helps to differ them from the, another snake species that they can be easily confused with, that is the uh, ring neck snake, is that they have keeled scales. So their scales are lifted. They are not smooth. And now we'll uh, move on to the smooth green grass snake. And so they are easily distinguished by their plain bright green scales. They look very different from any of the other snake species found in the province. And uh, they have a plain white underbelly. And again, as the name says, they have smooth scales. <laughs> and uh, we'll move on to our final snake now. So as I said before, this can be confused with the red belly snake, and this is the ring necked snake. And so the key identifying factor for this snake is that it is uh, the very, as namesake goes, uh, the uh, ring around the neck of the snake. and it has smooth scales in comparison to the red belly snake. So some other cool things about the snakes in our province is that the Eastern ribbon snake, the maritime garter snake, and the smooth green grass snake are all daynurnal uh, species. So that means that they are out throughout the day. And while the red bellied snake and the ring neck snake are mostly nocturnal, meaning that they are out throughout the night. And another interesting thing about our snake species in the province is that the eastern ribbon snake, the maritime garter snake, and the red-bellied snake have live birth, while the smooth green grass snake and the ring neck snake lay eggs. <clears throat> that is interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, lots of cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. So uh, thanks, Noah. And hopefully um, we had kind of said four to five. So we have uh, kind of 10 minutes left. Um, if anyone has, a, has any questions about um, some of those species or, or the, uh, the project or, um, you know, 
uh, Noah and uh, and some of the other people here, you know, have been uh, observing herps for a long time, and then maybe have some context for for what this year is looking like in general. Um, yeah, but uh, again, if anyone would like to get involved with the Herp Atlas who isn't already, um, it's as simple as uh, just sending us an email at herpsns at gmail dot com, and we'll uh, and we'll um, help you with that. Um, Susan Knutson says, is there anything landowners should be doing to protect herps? Um, I would say, I mean, a good uh, first step for something like this um, would probably be to, uh, to put in some effort doing some surveying to find some hotspots on, on the property that might potentially have herps um, and, and seeing if you, can, if you can observe them and then um, if you can, certainly there's some some measures that you could take uh, to protect different species. But um, in general, uh, I think herps, like a lot of the the other uh, smaller species we have, suffer a lot when we let our uh, our cats out. And um, so I think that's uh, probably a very simple thing that uh, homeowners can do to to help herps a little bit on their property. Um, and Jane is also uh, giving a comment here, and um, that a few years ago she had someone. Uh, or we heard a presentation about how road salting um, can affect the amphibians in a negative way, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think kind of following that train of thought, uh, that's something that everyone could do on their land as well. Um, you know, just think about what you're putting down, with, whether it's salt or, or uh, pesticides or um, chemicals of, of other types, um, especially around little areas where there's water, little wetlands. And so Devin uh, has a question about observing wood turtles and when the best time would be to go out and to observe them. Noah, do you have any, uh, do you have some comments on that? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say great job, Devin. You're nailing all those observations. Yeah, you're really doing yeah. good, man. And I would, uh, uh, I, would I would mimic that as well. <laughs> Name that we recognize well. <laughs> um, I could say... I myself haven't got to the privilege to observe a wood turtle yet, but definitely I think uh, the way that you can set yourself up to best be able to observe one would be that you go to where they are found. And that is, uh, let me see here. <laughs> well, and while, uh, while you find that, Noah, I mean, I, I think the other thing, uh, you know, we've been mentioning collaboration and, <clears throat> Um, you know, how much, uh, you know, we're, we're really a team of, of organizations working on this. And I know uh, the Queen Annapolis River Project uh, does work yeah. um, on wood turtles. And they're one of our, our key partners on this project. So um, we could also uh, get you in touch with someone over there. Who, you can maybe get out with them and uh, do some monitoring or something. Um, I'd say that's sure definitely it. the best way to get out to find one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you are frequenting Eastern and Central Nova Scotia or on Cape Breton Island, they are there, but they're, they're pretty constricted to certain water courses and stuff. So if you really research it extensively and stuff and set yourself up to be in the right habitat, that, that should put you with uh, the best chance to get to observe a wood turtle without as Nick said, going out with an organization to work with them is absolutely a great way. Yeah. Um, so Kristen uh, from the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council um, says that they're working on a project right now where they're mapping invasive fish and plants and uh, seeing how it's overlapping with native herps. Um, so again, I think highlighting uh, the interest that there is right now in, in studying herps and, and how important that is. So it's great to hear that the uh, Invasive Species Council is doing that as well, Kristen. Um, and then have we had any observations of herps benefiting from invasive plants uh, and some examples? Um, I don't know if we have that yet. And, and, you know, we haven't necessarily been putting out the call for that specific thing. But I think, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we potentially could continue to do. And that's one of the advantages, I think, of basing this on iNaturalist is that uh, we're gonna continue to use iNaturalist for the, for the coming years. And if we can uh, get that out as something that would be kind of particularly cool for people to look for as they're 
as they're seeing the herps. And, you know, the, the feedback we're getting generally is that people really want to help. So if we can communicate to them that it'll be particularly helpful if we can see some, some herps using invasive plants potentially and, and the context of that, um, I think there'd be potential, but I'm, I'm not sure if we have it yet. Okay, yeah, it just came up. Somebody asked me the other day because we we're talking about maybe removing Phragmites and the, the question of, well, do maybe nesting turtles benefit from them being there? And like, does the benefit outweigh the risk was something that came up. So yeah, I'd be interested to talk more if you guys ever go forward with anything like that. Yeah, well, and uh, and I think, uh, you know, on the, on the subject of collaboration, I think we're hoping that we'll have you guys uh, as well at the table when we have our our, uh, our kind of planning meeting next time. So um, awesome. we can bring that up and, and see what everyone has to say. Cool. Hmm. So had a had a bit of trouble with uh, with COVID uh, this year. Devin did, but hopefully next year. And and again, I think that's maybe part of uh, you know we kind of just went into uh, using iNaturalist, but for sure, um, you know, part of the context for this is that it also happened uh, under the cloud of COVID. And so for us, um, it was also a benefit to use iNaturalist, even with some of those drawbacks that we have, and um, because it meant that we could uh, encourage people going out even individually and collecting this data that can, uh, at the end of the day, be useful. So, um, yeah. Uh, will we be doing frog call surveys? Um, yeah, I mean, I think organizing some events, um, that's the other thing that kind of suffered because of COVID is, is the lack of kind of organized events around the Herp Atlas and, and, uh, and promoting it. But I think a, an event around frog calls would be really awesome. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, uh, I didn't quite get into this time because I always find I speak too much just about kind of iNaturalist instead of, of the project, but it's really great that finally iNaturalist is letting us uh, upload audio recordings and uh, we are seeing quite a few. So maybe um, we can work together, um, Ron, to, to set up a, a project like that. Um, Ron has been um, promoting our, our events extensively as well. So another person to thank. All right, well, um, if there aren't any other questions, maybe uh, we will miraculously uh, finish a Zoom call right on time and uh, wrap this up by five o'clock. Thanks so much, both of you. Awesome job. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, and thank you guys. It's, uh, it was really nice to get to uh, to participate. And oh, Ron, yes, thank you. Sorry, um, the link to our uh, our survey. I, I uh, have posted it, Ron, in our uh, on the iNaturalist uh, journal. Um, sharing for a second here. Let's go get that right now and send it to you, Ron. That was super interesting. Thank you. Problem. All right, sorry about that, uh, guys. Thanks, Ron, for the uh, for the reminder. Uh, I think it only uh, it should only take uh, three minutes. It's a, it's a quick survey, really, just uh, kind of a quick estimation of of time. And uh, wondering if you're interested in uh, next year, and uh, some quick comments.
We'll just wait a sec, just make sure that uh, that Ron opened it there and stuff. Um, what do you think, Noah, the fact that you've now seen the three, we have the three blue morph. And I think it's incredible. I, I was amazed when I got to see one, like to, to see that it's that many in the province. I think it's like it's a pretty good rate of them, apparently. Yeah, it's interesting because it's, it's one in a million, isn't it supposed to be? Yes, yeah, so it's like we're we're defying the odds here, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Any question about that, Noah? Yeah. Is, is, is it a sign of anything? Is it a sign of environmental stressors or is it just, you know, is is the fact that we're seeing so many of them likely to be indicative of something bad? I think I don't think it has to do with anything bad. Uh, I really I can't exactly pronounce the exact condition, uh, like uh, mutation that it is. It's like anaxism or something like that. But it's basically like the same as a, a leucistic or a melanistic. Like it doesn't pose any like threat to the specimen's health mm -hmm. more than it does just mutate it, its color and stuff. But if we suddenly started having blue frogs blue, everywhere blue blue rivers it would have a an advantage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and something interesting like uh this frog is pretty close to my home so i got to spend a lot of time like observing it and stuff and like all the other frogs will jump away and stuff and this frog will sit there and you can like just stand right beside it and stuff and it won't move and i think that maybe that has like a, a part to do with it like the camouflage is different and so maybe it does put like a little bit of an advantage or an, or a hindrance on the animal that it does like change its behavior a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, it, but as far as like the habitat health, I, I don't think it has as much uh, to relate to that as much as it does just the, the genetics of the frog kind of, and the, the more blue frogs we have in the province too, like the, the higher rate of blue frogs that will yeah. be kind of thing. Yeah. They yeah. Find each other. Yeah. Could could be a little army of them someday. <laughs> Great, that was awesome. Thanks, guys. No problem. Um, and I figure uh, I think Ron probably had time to check that out. Uh, if uh, if not, um, I'll uh, I'll reach out anyway by email and make sure you get that. Um, I'll be reaching out to our partners anyway. So thanks, uh, thanks, guys, and we'll uh, we'll wrap up the meeting.